Okay, so a very good evening to all our audience um, in the Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So we are from Astronomical Society of Penang and welcome everyone to our monthly airport discussion session. And this is the month of August. So we are discussing airport, uh, which is the astronomy photo of the day for August. So up to today, we already have 28 photos, but we will select about uh, 17 photos to be discussed and to be presented in this session. So a brief self-introduction. Self so I'm Lai, a committee member from Astronomical Society of Penang. And together with me, we have Dr. Chok, President of Astronomical Society of Penang. Hi, Dr. Chok. <laughs> and then... Also, today we have two new faces uh, for the airport for this year. So, first, uh, we have our old friend, all right, which is Yong Lip, uh, currently in Taiwan, uh, Taiwan Chenggong, National Chenggong University, studying physics. So, he's a final year student in physics and he's currently doing his final year project, which is related to astronomy. So, he has a, a lot of knowledge and he's expert in ex astronomy. So feel free to ask questions uh, during the session. All right. And he can answer everything. So don't worry. All right. He's an expert. And also we have a new friend today, uh, the first time joining us in AIPOD, which is uh, who is uh, Jun Zien, uh, David from, from this uh, Nanjing Universities of Aeronautics and Astronautics, uh, or the Nanhang Universities. So, Junjian is joining, is also a member, all right, and he's joining us since at a very young age, all right, since his primary school. So, he's expert in a lot of hands-on work, all right, and he have a great interest in astronomy, and he also took a lot of uh, astronomy photos, all right. So he is uh, also an amateur astrophotographer all right so let's start with today so before we start just a gentle reminder to everyone so if happens that you have any questions uh, feel free to ask us all right through the comment section in the facebook sorry the comment section in the facebook page or the chat session in the youtube in the youtube channel so let's start with today's airport which is 25th uh, sorry 28th of august so I'll start the first one. So here you go. All right, so can see my screen? Yes, can see. Can see you also. All right. Yes. So the astronomical photos of our astronomical pictures of the day. Uh, is the Mars Rock Rochette. All right, so this image is taken by NASA, uh, the GPL or Caltech. So as we remember, uh, somewhere this time last year, somewhere in July, end of July, uh, last year, 2020, all right, there's this launch of three missions to the Mars. And the first who land on the, among these three missions, all right, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, Tianwen mission, and then the United Emirates Hope mission, and also uh, the American Perseverance mission. So among these three missions, Perse Perseverance is the first who landed on Mars in the J0 crater, all right, early in, somewhere in February this year, I think 18 February, if I'm not mistaken. So it landed, and then... The, the most eye-catching mission of this Perseverance, of course, is the Ingenuity helicopter. But today, all right, the, the main character is not the Ingenuity uh, helicopter. All right? We have discussed that in our previous airport. So today is this, the Mars Rock, nicknamed Rochette. All right? So I'll slightly enlarge a bit. So this is it. So this... This uh, perseverance, all right, so this is the perseverance, all right, and this photo, all right, this image is taken by the has cam, all right, or the hazard camera, the front has cam, which is this one, all right, so 
the whole perseverance there are a lot of cameras all right we have the nav cam the navigation camera up there and then behind we also have the subsurface radar and also a real test cam but the front one this is taken by, by the front one okay how i know is the front one is actually mentioned over here because it mentioned that this wheel is the front wheel so if this is the front wheel then it is taken on the on the front one and of course this is it all right for the sam this is a preparation for this sample return mission sample return mission so for this perseverance we will not have sample return but in the future mission all right currently perseverance will first collect the sample and store it and then after in the future mission the rover the next rover will make perseverance to collect the sample and then will return to earth and then by then we might able to collect the mass mission uh, mass rock sample all right so this is it about a pot today so i'll pass over to jun zian uh, to proceed with the next a pot all right so jun zian okay. yeah Can you hear my screen? Yes. Okay. So this is the airport for the 24th of August. And in this photo, you can see like a protostar and a uh, planetary disk forming around the pro around the protostar. So you can see like a planetary disk. So it's like the solar system actually forming. And here you can see one small dot here is actually a new planet that is formed so this image is captured by alma one of the big uh, observatories on the world uh, so this star actually formed from a cloud of gas so the gas actually collapsed into a one small point and um the gas actually will coalesce into this big disk and the star will form from this uh, giant cloud of material and then the planets will form from like the uh, the stuff that the star did form from uh Share the... This is the next step. This is the airport for August 23rd. Uh, this, this is actually an image of a galaxy. Image of a galaxy. But the galaxy is behind a few stars. So the stars will actually bend the light that is coming from the galaxy. So in according According to Einstein's theory of, gen of relativity, a big, a thing of big mass will actually bend light. So the light from the galaxy, because it's behind the star, the light will actually go around the star and focus back to you. So it's not a straight line; it's a curved line that is taking. That's why the galaxy is, has such a odd shape. So this is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope and is processed by these are messy and yeah because it has four stars the the bending of light is not really a uh, cyclical because some images you can see uh if you have one star in the center, then you bend in sort of like a donut shape, you can see, and then the, there'll be a star in the middle. But because there are four stars here, or even more, the bent light will be uh, not symmetrical. Uh, 
this is the epoch for August 21st. So this is a picture of Jupiter. Jupiter, and in this image you can see the four Galilean moons: Io, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. All four in this photo, and three of those moons are actually in front of the in front of Jupiter here. Two of which you can see the shadow. So it's like a three moon eclipse. And in this photo here, you can see Jupiter again, but one of the moons is crossing behind the other moon. So in our point of view, one of the moons is actually behind the other, but because there are two shadows here, the other moon is still uh, in sunlight, although it's blocked by, it's blocked in our view. So all of these three photos are, is actually taken over the course of one night because Jupiter actually rotates so fast and then the, uh, the orbits of the moons actually move so fast that you can actually capture a lot of motion in one night. And here you have another photo where the moon is behind the other big moon. And you can see two shadows again. So this is actually a very nice photo of the Perseid. What are the Perseid uh, meteors? So earlier this month in August, there's actually the Perseid meteor shower. So there were actually a lot of meteors that coming into the Earth's atmosphere and making a lot of light and putting on a nice show. But um, this meteor in particular, you can see a very small tail behind and then suddenly a very bright spot. So the meteor is coming through the Earth's atmosphere very fast. And then around somewhere at the bright spot here, the meteor actually broke up into many pieces. So it burned up extremely fast and produced a lot of light. So, and you can see a diff different colors on the meteor also. So the different colors will actually tell you what is the chemical composition of the meteor based on like what color they off when they burn and stuff like that. So uh, meteors have actually a lot of color when they burn up in the atmosphere. Some will be more colorful than others, but there are a lot of colors, a lot of different colors, purple, red, pink, orange, almost the whole spectrum. So if you capture that light and then you, um, and then you do some kind of research on the, on the color, you can actually guess, you can actually get, have a good guess on what the uh, chemical composition of the meteor is. So, uh, do I pass it on to the... Yongli, you're on? Yeah, Yongli. Okay. okay, hello. Okay, good evening, everyone. So I'm Yongli. So today I will present to you, I, I'm your presenter today. So, okay, can you see it? Okay. So uh, the first picture I'm presenting is uh, a perfect spiral. This is the picture for 13th of August, 2021. So I'm presenting the spiral galaxy. So this, this spiral galaxy has a name, it's called M74. This is a magnificent spiral galaxy with a central bulge surrounded by sp those spiral arms of gas and du dust and many young stars. So now I will introduce to you the Messier object. The Messier object is named after Charles Messier He's an astronomer in the 18th century. So 
The massive object is a catalog of 110 astronomical objects containing stars, these are nebula, star clusters, and also galaxies. So let's have a look at the messy objects. This is a list of 110 astronomical objects. So over here, you can see 74. It means it, M74, which is the spiral galaxy we are looking today. So this is a really nice album, album of deep sky objects and taken by taken by uh, V throughout the years. So the spiral galaxy M74, it consists of 100 billion stars, which is roughly the same order as the Milky Way. It's located 32 million light years away towards the constellation of Pisces. So it's quite dim and also very difficult to observe. It has a sm small bulge at the center and has no bar, unlike, unlike our Milky Way, which, which is but spiral. The best thing about this galaxy is we are looking at it face on and and not from the side like some sometimes you will see the galaxy from the side and it's it's less beautiful but this we are looking at it face on it's it's very very nice we can enjoy the spiral arms in its full glory so it has a uh, it has beautiful spirals traced by blue these blue star clusters and dark cosmic lanes over here. So this is actually a composite image taken by you taken using multiple cameras by the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is it's not it's not a simple picture. The reddish glow that you you saw over here is actually the emissions by the hydrogen atoms. These are actually star forming regions where the next generation of stars are born. So this uh, spiral galaxy actually spans about 30,000 light years. So it's actually a very huge di distance. And also, it has a, it is a very nice spiral. So this spiral galaxy actually obeys the golden ratio. So, so this is the, uh, this is five, which is 1.618. It's actually a, an irrational number. So the, the ratio of the squares, the, the next squares are 1.618 smaller than the, 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 the squares before. So this is the, the golden ratio. You can compare with the spiral galaxy, the, the golden spiral. So the next epoch, <clears throat> Island Universe, Cosmic Sand. So this is actually a very creative name. I wonder what it is. So this is 14th of August. So it's actually Andromeda Galaxy and Perseid Meteor Shower. So you can see Androme Andromeda Galaxy over here. And here is the Perseid Meteor Shower. So the island <coughs> universe is referring to Andromeda Galaxy. And cosmic sand is referring to meteor, the meteor, the Perseid meteor shower. Let's have a look at uh, the meteor shower, Messier objects and Andromeda galaxy M31. So back, back to this uh, album. 
M31 is over here. So this is Andromeda galaxy. So this is a two-in-one image taken by an astrophotographer, Marzena Rukonzinska. So it's a, it shows Andromeda galaxy and a perceived meteor shower uh, mid flying by. So this is actually a 30 second of exposure of the night sky at uh, Busco Zdroch, which is a town in Poland. So the meteor is very bright and has very colorful trail. This this trail actually comes comes from uh, specific elements burning in our Earth's atmosphere. Green color is due to magnesium burning up in the Earth's atmosphere, while pink the slight pinkish color that you saw just now is actually due to calcium burning in our Earth's atmosphere. So, the meteors have their, their own colors. So, this is a, the characteristic of a perceived meteor shower. We have half pink and half green trails. So, let me show you the, the colors of the meteors. So each colors of these meteors actually corresponds to different elements burning burning up in, in our Earth's atmosphere. So this uh, dark red is due to oxygen, and then red nitrogen, sodium is, is yellow, and magnesium and calcium over here. So it corresponds to different uh different wavelengths in the, in, in the visible spectrum. So the Andromeda galaxy M31, it can be seen as a fuzzy blob in the night sky using our naked eye. It's actually a, an entire group outside our galaxy, far away. So we named it the island universe. We, the, the galaxy is an entire island outside our outside our own island so i really like the the name of this uh airport so please have a look at this picture again so over here you can see there's actually stuck like a uh, a group of stars over here it's actually actually a star cluster so we can see a double star cluster below the meteor. It's actually the open cluster NGC 869 and NGC 884. So many, man, many star clusters are, so you can, many stars are actually forming in the star clusters. And these stars are relatively young. So this, this, this star cluster is actually uh, located at Perseus constellation, which, which is uh, the, the origins of those Perseid meteor showers. So next picture is, is the ring nebula. The ring nebula, uh, that, there are actually two pictures uh, featuring this ring nebula, which is 17 and 18 of August. 2021. So the, the reason why I'm, I'm choosing these two pictures be, is because they are, they are actually the, the same objects, but shown in different ways. So on the 17th of August, you can see the ring nebula. So the, the ring is over here. And this is the whole of the ring. We can see the ring nebula from, from the ring nebula from Hubble. This is actually taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this picture is processed by Judith Schmidt. 
So remember, this is the ring nebula. As, as for the next picture, we can see here. Here is the ring nebula, but, but it's slightly different from the previous picture. So on the 18th of August, we can see rings around this uh, ring nebula. This is, but there, there are actually more you can see over here. So, we can also see this, uh, spher this spherical object around the ring nebula. This is actually a composite image taken by different uh, telescopes. The first, the first telescope is, is uh, of course, the, the Hubble Space Telescope. With a, uh, which is a 2.4 meter space telescope. The second one is the large binocular telescope. So it's, a, it's like a binocular with two 8.4 meter telescope in Arizona. Next, we have Subaru, Subaru telescope, which is 8.2 meter in, in Japan. So this is a composite image put together by Robert Gendler. So some information about the ring nebula. The ring nebula is also a uh, massive object, M57. So this ring nebula is uh, a type of emission nebula located at uh, Lyra, Lyra constellation. So this nebula is a planetary nebula, which means it is formed by the remnants of low or intermediate stars, which, are, which, which is less than eight solar masses that died a long time ago. So the envelope, the, the stars ejected is enveloped during the last stages of the star and formed this beautiful ring nebula. So let's have let's review uh, this Messier catalog again. So M seventy four uh no M fifty seven M fifty seven is over here the ring nebula. So we have M seventy four M thirty one M fifty seven. So we've reviewed uh three of the Messier objects over uh hundred and ten. Next, uh, there, are, there are three types of nebula. The first one is the emission nebula, which you can see over here, which, uh, which we are looking right now. The, the ring nebula is uh, an emission nebula. Next one is uh, it's called a reflection nebula. So uh, is is formed by re reflecting light uh, or or scat or more precisely scattering light from from stars and then absorption nebula which uh, absorb light from the stars so uh, i will give you some uh, physics background re related to this emission nebula so the energy of this uh, nebula came from stars that are very hot. So the temperature is around, the, the surface temperature is around, wait, the surface temperature is around uh, 20,000 uh, Celsius. So these stars uh, actually emit a lot of UV rays, and these UV rays will actually excite the outermost electron to a higher energy state. So when this electron falls back to, to the ground state, it will emit this, this light. And this light is the, 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 the color that you saw, saw in the nebula. So remember from, from, the, the, from physics, the wavelength is actually associated to the energy level of the atom. So 
delta E equals HC over lambda. So delta E is, is, the, is the energy level difference of the atom. H is the Planck's constant. C is, uh, is the speed of light in vacuum. Both of these are constants, but uh, lambda is the wavelength of the light you are looking at. So uh, here I have, an, I have uh, an analogy for you, if it's uh, a bit difficult to, to imagine. So you can imagine uh, the electron is, uh, is representing the boulder. The, the man is actually the, the starlight pushing the boulder. So and you have uh, the, the, the energy gap, which is an energy, actually an energy barrier. So you can imagine that the starlight pushes uh, the electron over the, uh, the, the mountain. If, if the, the starlight has enough energy to, to push this electron over the energy barrier, this electron, uh, ju just, just enough energy, it will actually push uh, this boulder down the hill. So we can you can think think of it as the 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 rolling rock as uh, releasing releasing light in terms of this electromagnetic radiation. So the the color of this uh color of color of wavelength you are looking at is is uh associated with the energy energy gap given by the, the equation I gave you just now. So, but this this is just an analogy. Don't don't take it too seriously, too literally. So the ring nebula is uh, actually is mostly an emission nebula. It has a beauty beautiful ring structure like Saturn, which means it has many many ring many layers. The red glow came from nitrogen emission. Oh here, the red glow. The green, the green ring is caused by oxygen. Oxygen, the emission from oxygen. Just, just like the, the green you saw in Aurora. Next, the blue center is actually given off by helium, helium emission, which is which is actually the hottest. And the outer layers you see in the in the second picture, in this dark red uh, spherical blob, is actually uh, a, a false color, a false color of infrared uh, from given off by hydrogen. This is hydrogen emission, but you can't see with your naked eyes. You you need uh, a, a special kind of the uh, cameras. So the second picture is actually a composite image of visible light and infrared. So this is uh, the 3D model of Green Nebula. So the, the, the astronomers actually made a, a really nice 3D model of the Ring Nebula. So the, the, the red and green is, is actually a ring around this uh, ring, uh, ring nebula. They are circling uh, an egg-shaped light object. An egg-shaped light object. So this, uh, this egg-shaped object is actually the, the blue color that you saw in the ring nebula just now. So, Next, I want to uh, compare both both images, both images uh, of the ring nebula. So for 7, 17th of August, it puts more emphasis on the ring part of the ring nebula in the visible spectrum. As for 18th of August, it gives you a bigger picture and it has a visible part over here and uh, an infrared part which is in deep red color over here 
So, so this deep rate can only be seen uh, through infrared wavelength. And that, that's, that's all for my presentation today. Thank you. So, Dr. Chong? Thank you. Like, can you see my screen? Huh? Like, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. So, okay, uh, very good evening. And just, just to let you know, so we are on the worldwide internet, no? So, good morning, good afternoon. And if you are in the North Pole watching, it will be good whole day, 24 hour day. You are in the South Pole, it will be good whole night, 24 hour night. All right. And you are in the space station in space, huh? the ISS or the, or this, uh, uh, what do you call Chinese uh, space station? It'll be no time because it goes around the, wo the world in 20, 19 minutes. All right. So uh, we start now. And just to let you know, so we would like to thank our Mr. Lai. He's the one who select for every month the pictures to be presented, airport pictures. I'm very happy that he gave me the pictures for this month. All right. I like these pictures. August the 16th, 2021. All right. So what's the name first? Race price. And Nova RS or Fucus. Now, Sprite uh, is not the Coca Cola drink, you not know, the lemon drink called Sprite, you know, in Malaysia. No. Race, race price is this one. I'll, I'll reduce the slice. There you are. These are the race Sprite. So it's a kind of uh, upper atmosphere lightning, all right? Not, not, not uh, as low as uh, the lightning on the Earth. It's very high up, you know, from 40 kilometers from the Earth's surface to about 80 kilometers close to space already. All right, so basically what is in here is, uh, just let you know, uh, is actually Pacific Meteor, there you are, a bright Pacific Meteor, one, race price, two, a series of price, upper atmosphere lightning, three, NOVA RS or Focus, there you are, that's a NOVA in space. Plus the Milky Way Galaxy, this is a four in one, so this is very, very rare, right? Taken by our Mr. Daniel Corona, a Mexican astrophotographer from Zatake, uh, what do you call, uh, Zacatecas in, uh, in uh, Mexico, Mexico, in Mexican versus Mexico, Mexico, right? So there you are, your hand, so very nice, huh? So of course, Milky Way, you all know, you can see, so basically, it, just put your camera there and expose it for a few minutes. And you're lucky that during the meteor shower, because it's on the 16th of August, there it came, all right? The peak was on 13th of August, but a few days later, still there. And then you can see the Sprite. Sprite is a kind of uh, upper atmosphere lightning that was first observed in the end of the 19th century, but was first photographed in 1994 only. But now it seems it's observed all over the world, everywhere. So next time you take some SO photograph, please look at your picture you will have captured a sprite here right so very nice so of course what i mean by sprite means a discharge of electric current passing through the atoms in the atmosphere that give off the red light right so this is a very rare picture a four in one you know right so this is our rs opulcus and what is our rs opulcus here it is a recurrent NOAA. so rs opulcus is a NOAA. And it is in the constellation of Fucus. So it's basically, it's a binary system where you have a white dwarf here on the right, and on the left is a red giant. And they're orbiting each other anti clockwise. So from time to time, the gravity of the white dwarf is strong enough to pull the material from the red giant to go into the white dwarf. And you accumulate, accumulate. And for RS, or, uh, Nova RS or Fucus, every 15 years, there's enough uh, material accumulated from the red, dwarf, the red giant to the white dwarf that you explode. And then this star normally cannot be seen with the naked eye, can become naked eye visibility. So it's called a recurrent nebula. Recurrent means what? Repeating nebula. All right? Uh, Nova. Every uh, 15 years, it will recur. Nova in, in Latin means like a bright star. All right? So this is called a uh, thing. So this binary star system where you have this recurrent Nova occurs quite often. Now, for this uh, Nova RS of Fucus, if we wait long enough, maybe after a few hundred thousand years, it may even accumulate enough material from the red giant to go around the uh, uh, white dwarf 
and the mass of the white dwarf will exceed the Chandra Shaker mass. And what happened? You explode as a supernova. Uh, this can occur also, but it will be in every once in every few hundred thousand years. All right. So now we go to the next picture. August the 15th. I really like this picture. Like, thanks for giving me this picture. Look here. Pacific meteor rain. Voila. Ten, ten, ten. So it's taken by Lu Hong Hong Yang, a Chinese uh, astro photographer, landscape astro photographer. And this is called Pacific rain. You know, basically, he, he, he took a, a long exposure of the Pacific meteor shower coming up from the Perseus constellation. It will come up. And then he said, how come Ben? Huh? How come Ben? Because when he took it just uh, originally, it come out all in a straight line. But he processed the picture that on top, he didn't compress the picture. Uh, somewhere in the middle, he compressed it slightly so they see it's curved here. Meteor shower cannot be straight, a curved one, huh? you see all straight line. And the bottom is curved. Why does he want to curve it? To make it look like rain la, falling down on this uh, Lu Ho Yang and, and his friend, la, right? And then what is this? So basically somewhere in his left hand, there's a flashlight, a faint flashlight shining to the umbrella, right? And he seems to expose it for a few minutes. So normally the umbrella will, will look so bright that after three minutes become very bright. So basically it's Persid rain with, uh, with uh, what they call Persid meteor shower and Milky Way, right? Like rain falling on this umbrella. Actually the rain won't fall because the meteors all burn up about 80 kilometers from the Earth's surface only all burn up. But just the idea, like nature rain, all right? And then it's done in where? It's taken in uh, near Jiuquan City, Gansu province, China. Somewhere in the horizon, you can see some light. Jiuquan City is actually where the Chinese send their Shenzhou manned space flight. So this is the Chinese spaceport, you know, space center. I really like this picture. Huh? So you have here, you have Pacific meter shower, all right? Uh, Milky Way, Jupiter, Saturn, and a happy couple here. Very nice, no? It's very artistic. Eh? So thank you, uh, uh, Lai, for giving me this picture. So Lai, you're, you're, you're next for your picture. Yep. All right. So let's proceed. So it's me again. All right. So let's move on to the airport on 11th of August. So yeah, I'll say the airport of 11th of August is a very rare picture that appears on a pop it's all about clouds so for my past experience since we are doing this a pot for since last year i think not more than two or three photos uh, about clouds on earth all right about clouds on earth uh, are selected as a pot so this is a photo taken by michael johnston he, michael johnston is actually a canadian landscape photographer all right uh if you click into this one you will link into his instagram and you will see a lot of beautiful landscape pictures including buildings all right so this is taken in a city in a canada called uh, saskatchewan all right saskatchewan uh, a canada's city so clouds all right so in in earth in astronomy we actually don't like clouds especially our friends who have a lot of interest in astrophotography or even professional astronomer, we actually don't like clouds, especially at night, because it affects our sight for stargazing. So clouds is actually not that preferable or less welcome in the world of astronomy. But uh, in fact, all right, uh, the truth, the fact is, in astronomy, actually study, studying clouds is actually important. But before we discuss about the importance, so this is something special, all right? Why this clouds is different? How this cloud is different is this cloud is known as the Mammoth's cloud. Sure. All right. So that means if you look at the structure, it's like uh, it's like uh, something very different to the normal clouds you see. So the normal clouds you see, you will realize that the bottom is usually quite flat, but this one the bottom is a bit round. All right. So it's round. So it's the most unusual and distinctive clouds uh, form with a with a series of bulges or porches. All right. So the series. It's a series of bulges or porches, so it's a porch shape. Uh, from the base, uh, the, uh, the base of the cloud. So, at most of the clouds, the base are flat. 
if you realize all right so if not all right maybe tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon take a look on the clouds you realize that very rare you will see the clouds uh, have uh, a round bottom or a porch bottom all right so back to the importance of clouds in astronomy clouds in earth is less welcome but actually clouds can tell us a lot of things all right in astronomy through clouds for example the clouds in jupiter clouds in venus we can through clouds we can understand the climate all right even in earth through clouds we can understand we can predict or we forecast our weather whether it will rain or not all right so true clouds can tell us a lot of things about the planets so clouds is important all right so even though it affects our viewing of in stargazing but then it plays an important role in every planet all right so just a little bit more information all right so inside the clouds all right uh usually we'll say clouds are made up of water droplets uh, this is not accurate all right this is not wrong but it's not accurate the accurate is clouds inside the clouds all right there are two things all right of course water droplets is is there but the water droplets is actually a super cool water droplets uh, what does it mean by super cool water droplets a super cool water droplets is actually a uh, liquid or super cool liquid that means water in droplets form but it's remain in liquid state remain in liquid state but the temperature is below zero degrees celsius so it's known as super cool super cool sorry so inside the clouds is super cool liquid all right or super cool liquid droplets or water droplets and also ice so these are the two common things that we have in clouds and in aerospace engineering uh, clouds is actually quite important we have a course all right called the aircraft anti-icing system that means we start we are taking care of aircraft icing issue so the first lecture the first chapter we study is about clouds there are different types of clouds at different altitude with different temperature with different clouds the aircraft pass through then the different types of ice will form on the aircraft wing and the, the different type of ice we have uh, the difficulty on removing the ice is also different and the danger the dangers or the risk caused towards the aircraft is also different on different types of clouds so certain clouds you have you can you can pass through easily okay you can fly through the clouds but certain clouds you have to avoid it all right so this is about clouds all right a little bit information about clouds so whether in astronomy or in engineering in aerospace engineering clouds is actually important topic to be studied all right so this is about clouds so let's proceed to the next airport which is airport on 10th of august so looking at this all right uh the first impression is what is this all right and in fact this is fire in space so this is a flame right fire so fire in space uh on earth we usually we see fire all right in teardrop shape all right so i, I i'm sure you all seen uh fire like this like a candle a teardrop shape that means like a tear or a droplet shape so this is fire of, of a candle but a more common fire that you all have seen i believe everyone have seen is like this all right uh, or when the flame is big it's like this uh it doesn't look like teardrop anyhow but then uh, the fact is if it is a single flame all right then it is a teardrop shape but then because affecting by the turbulence of the air uh, nearby the flame all right so the air nearby the flame here is turbulent so causing changing in direction or unstable that means causing the flame is unstable so you will see uh, the effects of turbulence on the flame but if you really want to see a teardrop flame all right you can actually observe from your gas stove if you have a gas stove all right you you see so because on the gas gas stove all right uh there's less turbulent affecting the flow of the air nearby the gas stove on top of the gas stove so you can see a better a better teardrop shape all right over here even over here all right so all the exhaust all right or all the exit of the gas is uh the flame is a teardrop shape right and less affecting by the turbulence of the air so it's stable all right so back to this sorry back to this all right uh fire in the space so this is actually taken in the 
ISS Combustion Chamber. So this is actually an experiment did in ISS, all right, uh, in the combustion chamber integration rack. So there's a rack in the ISS used to study combustion. So conducting combustion experiment in ISS, is it dangerous? Of course, it is very, very dangerous. So they need to handle with care and it must be conducted inside the combustion chamber rack. So you cannot have flame inside the ISS directly, but only in this special chamber you can have the flame. So this is where they did this flame experiment. So we can realize that in the condition of microgravity, so we, we, without the effect or with minimal effect of gravity, the flame happens is the red, sorry, the flame occurs, uh, have a shape of in, in a sphere shape, in a spherical shape. And in science, we learn about for combustion to happen, for burning to happen, we need three, three components. All right, we need heat, we need oxygen, and we need fuel. All right, so if you look at this, all right, um, the combustion for the combustion to happen under microgravity condition, so the, the flame are sphere. So we look into it, you can see the flame are sphere. And also, because oxy in, in space, oxygen is the key element. All right, so and it is a rapid acquisition uh, of oxygen. Uh, so whenever oxygen is present, okay, in this in this volume or in this uh, specific space, whenever the ox oxygen is present, then the flame will happens there. So this flame, all right, will actually floats randomly in all direction. All right. So why we need to conduct such a dangerous experiment in ISS? Uh, the reason is very simple because Combustion is actually a very complex chemical reaction. All right. For example, I believe everyone are familiar with matches. All right, matches. So this one, matches. So just a simple example. All right. So the burning of matches or the combustion of matches is actually not a direct burning. All right. It's actually very complex and it's indirect burning. What does it mean? That means the fire is not directly on this wood. All right, is the heat py uh, pyrolyze the wood? All right, so the wood will give out the gases that is combustible. All right, and then together mixing with the air of the oxygen in the air. All right, so the gases, the heat, and then we have the flame. So that means fire is not directly on the wood. Okay, it is the pyrolysis process that release the burning gases or the fuel from the wood. All right, and then the leftover is the carbon, all right, which, which is the carbon. Okay, so next we move on to April 8th, 8th of August. So uh, this month, because this month we are in the Perseid Meteor Peak month. So that means this month you will able to see Perseid Meteor Shower. So over here, this is an old photo actually taken by Ron Garren, uh, American astronaut all right from the iss so i i always like this kind of photos you see so a lot of airport we are observing from ground level from certain observatory or at certain countries certain cities taking certain landscape but i always like different uh airport like this which is taking at different altitude for example taking from the space or taking from the flight deck taking pictures from aircraft all right, so I myself also have such experience on taking a sun hello uh, when I'm in a flight from Penang to Bangkok, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. So observing, observing this astronomical phenomena when at a different altitude, the, the experience is quite different. So if you all have a chance when travel resumes, if you have a chance, you all can try that. All right, uh, when you book a flight, try to request for a window seat and you will see a lot of things all right even though observing the moon from uh, 38000 meters sorry 38000 feet is different from the feeling is different from observing moon at the ground level so this one is taken also a perseid meteor taken uh, from the iss which is 380 kilometers above all right altitude 3080 Kilometers. So this is a perceived meteor. 
and we have a uh, quite a lot of discussion on person meteor just now so the another interesting thing that we need to we notice in this is the air glow so this thin green belt all right this thin green belt is air glow all right so what is air glow air glow is actually a faint emission of light rays uh, from planetary atmosphere that means if this planet have atmosphere most likely you can observe the air glow even in venus you can observe air glow there are air glow in venus observed before uh, by satellites all right and this is air glow just to point out a little bit is this air glow is nothing to do with the sunspot activity or the earth magnetic field all right it's actually the emission is a self emission by the particles in the atmosphere so it's an atmospherical optical phenomena but then it's nothing to do with the sunspot activity or the magnetic field all right so this is the air glow so the meteor is over here so this is the iss this is the solar panel so so for this year uh, the peak have passed all right but this year is actually a good a good year to observe Perseid meteor because uh the peak is on if i'm not mistaken it's on 13 of august which is a new moon so that means you don't have the effect of the moon the glow from the moon does not affect your viewing and in August, Perseid will, uh, sorry, Perseid, yeah, Perseus, the constellation Perseus rise uh, somewhere in the midnight, about 12, 12, 30, you can observe rising from the eastern horizon. So uh, even now, you already have passed the peak, all right? By chance, you can still see one or two meteor, all right, if you're lucky enough. But then, but then you can still see the constellation Perseus so just a final information so this perseid meteor is actually uh, the meteor caused by the comet called the comet swift turtle all right uh, this is the comet okay so it come nearest to the earth in the year of 1995 and have a period in 133 years that means one, 1995 uh, 133 years later that means uh to 2100 and something all right two one something you will only able to see this comment again so first meteor is caused by the leftover by this comment all right so that's all from me for the airport today so i'll pass over to, right, right, go back, go back to the the iss looking down on the earth the person meteor. okay i have one question for light but light don't answer it ask answer during the q a session now you have a meteor seen from the iss entering the earth atmosphere below the ISS. Now, what are the chances of this Perseid meteors are hitting the ISS? It's not the Perseid meteors, you know. In space, it's the Perseid meteoroid. It's only when they enter the Earth's atmosphere, burn up, it's called a meteor. But in space, do the Perseid meteoroid, what are the chances that hit the ISS? Because Perseid meteor shower is quite, quite dense, you know, a lot. So what are the chances of Perseid meteoroid hitting the ISS? Okay, so now I, I go to my part. Uh, I'm sharing a line. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I'll unshare. The, I will stop presenting now. Yeah. So just a, a, a little bit more comment. So if our audience happens to see any perceived meteor this year, all right, feel free to share to uh, share with us in the comment session on your experience on what observing this perceived. All right. Yes. Doctor John. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Right. So we go to the uh 6th of august all right star stars and dust across corona australis all right so basically you will see here stars law dust law now remember the space in between the stars is not pure vacuum you know it's hey, very dirty dust you know but that doesn't mean as much dust in the air you breathe in your room or on the floor maybe every cubic meter may have only one particle of dust all right and across Corona Australis. Corona Australis is the constellation of the uh, is of the southern crown in the southern sky, all right? Uh, taken by our Vikas Chandra, uh, an Indian landscape astrophotographer. Now, nowadays, the, the airport picture, they will, they will not say what telescope they take, which part of the country they take. They assume that 
the people who observe the, uh, look at the airport pictures are really quite expert that one no need to no need to explain all right so basically you have here you have this i make it smaller all right we have here some reflection nebula ngc 6727672667269 what's the reflection nebula all right like what our uh, young lips showed just now is you have a star here and actually uh earlier some of the stars here died already and blew off the shell of dust and the shell of dust is covering these young stars and then these stars will emit the light right and not emission nebula no it is reflected of this dust all right so that's it and here you see the funny looking object it's called the herbic hero object herbic hero is basically the young stars uh, that have they can shoot up the jets coming up so our our solar system they have in, in previously before was formed was a herbic hero object of course herbic is the name of dr herbic hero is the name of dr hero two american astronomers all right so you have this and also you have our ngc uh six seven two two three eh? uh global cluster so it's very nice those stars and dust across corona australis very nice so the next one is august the fourth i go here now it's very significant eh? august the fourth basically is a picture of the event horizon telescope esc resolve central jet from the black hole in San A. Remember, two uh, two years ago, 2019, Event Horizon Telescope uh, was supposed to see take an image of the black hole uh, uh, in M87. And the next one was this one. This one in Centaurus A is a is a very is a very active radio galaxy in the constellation of of Centaurus. I'll just read out the, the all the organizations involved. Uh, oh, no joke, man. All right. You have the Red Bull Unicy is a famous uh, Unicy in Holland. All right. So zero uh, ATNL is from Australia, and then the ESO European Southern Observatory and so on. And so all these are what these are doing what VLBI, very long baseline radio interferometry. And this Tanami one is one of those very long baseline. So basically, they added the Event Horizon Telescope plus all the other radio telescope to get this picture. So what is this? This is what this is an object of the Centaurus A that you can take with your large telescope from the Earth. Even MSS can take it. All right. So this is the moon for scale, huh? moon for scale. So now you will take the center part of it and enlarge. Did you see this one? All right. Color composite image of Centaurus A jet on galactic scale. All right. And this is a distance of 4,000 light years. You bring down here. So this central object here you enlarge to this whole object all right so the tanami vldi uh, uh what they call group uh, image the inner part of the uh, the jet here to get there you are this is the one and the distance here is one by day one by day is maybe from uh, the sun to about uh, uh somewhere in in the i would say somewhere in the outer part of the Kuiper belt right so this is a very small part you know very small part, huh? So this is what has been done by Event Horizon Telescope plus the other radio telescope. Now let's look at this Event Horizon Telescope. It's very really great, huh? So Event Horizon Telescope is a series of uh, short wavelength radio telescope all around the world, especially in North America, South America, uh, and in uh, Europe, combined into one very long baseline radio interferometry, and uh, the wavelength they have been using all this while was, for example, to de detect the black hole image in the M87, uh, and the, the this recent one in Centaurus A is 1.3 mm. All right, 1.3 mm. So we are looking at the angular resolution. Uh, what's the angular res resolution of the Event Horizon Telescope? We use the famous Rayleigh criterion. So the the theta is the smallest angular size that can be imaged. Uh, is 1.22. Lambda divided by B. Lambda is the wavelength that you're observing. In this case, it's 1.3 mm wavelength or 230 gigahertz. And B is the aperture of the telescope. And since you're using the whole world as a dish, so B here is the diameter of the Earth, 12,000 kilometers. 
And how how do you give one point two two? Usually when uh, when when people talk about this number, they just ignore it. So basically, see, in your telescope you have a circular aperture, no? So in a circular aperture, it's a diffraction limiter. You apply the the optical phenomena. You you apply. You use what's called the Bessel function. So the solution is a first order Bessel function. So the first order Bessel function is give a one point two two. That's why first order Bessel function. Whereas if you use a square aperture, it will, it will be no more one point two two. It will be another number, all right? So like this. So let's look at angular resolution of our human eye. One arc limit, not but not good, no. Sixty arc second, human eye, all right? A six inch Newtonian telescope. Imagine you have perfect viewing, no turbulence, no moon, and so on. The the perfect diffraction limited for a six inch aperture telescope is one arc second, not bad. Hubble Space Telescope is. 0.04 arc second. Hubble Space Telescope. That's 40,000 micro arc second. No. Ladies and gentlemen, now in astronomy, they can resolve objects in the universe even smaller now. The angular uh, resolution is better. So now they are talking about micro arc second. The Event Horizon Telescope, the resolution is 25 microseconds. Very, very small. So that's what it is. So basically, this whole series of telescope can can give you a very good resolution all right so right now the uh, what is called the event horizon telescope uses uh 1.3 mm all right 230 gigahertz resolution is 25 micro arc second they're going to upgrade soon even horizon telescope upgrade they're going to observe at 0 0.87 millimeter which is of course still radio wave but closer and closer to the far infrared so increase the frequency to 345 gigahertz and the wavelength is 0.87 uh, what you call uh, millimeter radio wavelength and the resolution in that case will be 16 microsecond micro arc second very fantastic now we go back to the image again it mentions here that actually this image here as seen from the earth but looking at the center of this uh, uh, what you call uh, Centaurus A is the size of a uh, angular size of a golf ball on the moon. Imagine you're on the moon, you you drop a, a object of four cm diameter on the moon, a white golf ball on the moon. It can be resolved from the Earth. So fantastic, you know, this resolution of the Event Horizon Telescope. All right. So now we go to the the last picture, the first of August. All right, so 1st of August, Pluto in enhanced color. Remember in 2015, NASA sent the New Horizons probe that flew by Pluto and took a lot of picture. And look at this picture. Wow, so detailed. So this one taken by the Event Horizon Telescope telescope. All right, and you can see the color image. And here you see the, the heart shape. Uh, uh, American newspaper like to put heart shape, but they give it a name, you know. They call it this object here, Tombo Tombo Regio. What Tombo? Tombo is Clyde Tombo lah. The one, the person who discovered uh, Pluto in 1930 in the Lowell Observatory in uh, New Mexico, in uh, uh, in uh, what they call in America. And uh, this is Tombo Regio. That's it. Beautiful. Got color, no? Pluto. Now remember, Pluto in 2006 has been downgraded to a dual planet. But in my heart. I still consider Pluto as a planet. I do not ag agree with the IAO designation that bring down the status of Pluto from a planet to a dual planet. Many people in the world do not agree. All right? They still think that Pluto is a planet. So in my mind, in my heart, Pluto is still a planet. Right? So beautiful Pluto. All right? And not to be outdone, this uh, uh, New Horizon space probe flew even further away from Pluto and 2019 flew next to a Kuiper Bay object called Arakot. Two pictures of Arakot. The furthest flyby of any object in the solar system by a human, human spacecraft. And now it's flying towards NASA. It's going to redirect its trajectory. Maybe you, you, you fly by another object in the Kuiper Belt. The furthest object to be seen by man. All right? But this is Pluto as seen by the New Horizons pro, uh, the spacecraft. All right? So I think uh, that's all for today, uh, the, the, the pictures. All right? So now we go to any questions, uh, like asked by the watchers 
Yeah, both so far no questions from both sides. So we, my question we go back to no my we question go back to the my yeah, we go back to the question. Okay, my yeah, question we, the so many Mitchell, uh, Mitchell, Mitchell on that, uh, uh, that the big night, uh, 12, 13 uh, August, certainly some of them must have hit the ISS. What are the chances of being hit by ISS? Uh? And if it, or, or, we know that they are very small particles, but if any of them hit the ISS, what type of damage uh, to ISS? Uh? Not only ISS, all the spacecraft. Actually, not only ISS face this problem, all right? We have about 2,000, 2000 overs uh, functioning satellites up there mm. which are still working and before we talk about we, we talk about this first uh, so the chance of hitting by this at this period is is slightly higher compared to the previous to the previous or to compared to others time all right so there is this experience even small asteroids sorry small asteroids or debris or other particles hit ISS, all right? And there are a few severe, uh, sorry, there are a few severe, uh, more severe and recorded or uh, and a, a published uh, accident caused by all these uh, meteorites or asteroids or this uh, debris, which is one is uh, it hits the windshield and cause crack on the windshield. And then, or uh, it actually happens also there is there's this space debris hit the iss and puncture the one of the wall of this iss so this is common up there all right so it's nothing i'll say it's nothing uh, it's nothing it's nothing odd or something or not considered as a special incidence yeah. all right and this is expected since the first day they launched this iss all right so usually what they did is they will actually avoid try to avoid so they will track all the space debris or all the particles nearby the iss so and they will have this computer to calculate right they, they will calculate uh yeah. the percentage of colliding with this iss of this all these part uh, all these part particles hitting the iss so if the probability sorry if the probability of coll collision all right, it's higher than one over one thousand. All right, then they will perform this. We call it uh, avoidance maneuver. All right, uh, yeah. they call it the, the uh, avoidance, the avoidance maneuver. All right, so that means they will move the ISS even to a higher orbit or a lower orbit to avoid this region before after passing through this region, then they will come back to 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 the normal level or the desired level. Uh, but then this is common all right uh this is common the probability is high all right but if we are focusing on meteorite all right i would say the probability is lower compared to space debris the the, the actual risk the higher risk one or the more dangerous one is actually the space debris or the space junk all right hitting the iss because after the after the satellite all right especially in the olden days when in the early days when we first launched these satellites all right or different different kinds of satellites um after the the mission the life mission ended the satellite life ended all right we don't have the technology or we don't have the awareness to bring back those uh old satellites so they are still floating up there so they there is a very high chance and they might be hit because they are out of control so they might be hit by meteorites or other space debris or even asteroids all right small asteroids so after hitting then they will break into small pieces and then causing more and more space debris so the chance or the probability of hitting iss is actually higher and higher and higher so that's why in recent recent years or recent launch satellite usually what they do is after the mission ended they will deorbit for leo orbit for satellites in Leo orbit, they will deorbit the spacecraft or they will deorbit the satellite. So it will come back in the Earth and burn up in the Earth atmosphere. But for the old satellites, that means in the early days when they first launched this satellite, we, at that time we still don't have awareness. So a lot of that is still up there. So that is the, actually the more dangerous one compared to meteorites. I just want to add on to what Lai said. Huh? Of course, Lai said, uh, if but just to mention, in space, uh, everything travels very fast. For example, the orbital speed of the ISS is about 7 kilometers per second. 
a bullet will leave a, a, a gun at one kilometer per second. So the ISS travel around the Earth seven times faster than a bullet. No? Let's say I have my hand here, a marble. Eh? Imagine a marble traveling at seven kilometers per second, hit the ISS, enter as a small hole, it goes out as a gigantic hole. So we are saying that not the damage by a big object or one, one uh, CM, you know, even a tiny dust particle would damage the, 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 the outer skin of, of it. So that's it. Now, like what I say, more and more, uh, they just, so now there are a lot of uh, schemes and, uh, and conferences being held of how to, to do a space salvaging company. You start up a company so that you go into space. Imagine you are like, you're playing baseball, uh, the baseball card, your, your hand here, got a glove and catch it off. So you have a kind of a big net uh, that can catch this object in space. Or if you see in the science fiction movie, a tractor beam. It's a beam, electromagnetic, that you can catch an object in space. So if you come up with a successful uh, technique, uh, they can catch all the small and uh, big uh, uh, objects circling the Earth. Low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, geostation orbit. Wow, you become a um, billionaire. So people are thinking about it, you know, think of how to bring down, salvage all this. So we, we know that as the time goes by, more and more satellites go into space and more and more crash will occur. So in time to come, if you don't reduce this uh, debris, debris fever orbiting the Earth, maybe in the not too distant future, from the Earth, you want to send a space probe from the Earth to go to Mars is impossible. You pass through the debris field, so totally, we surely hit and damage the space craft. So in other words, we'll be trapped on the Earth by the debris field. So they have to think of a way how to remove the debris field. All right, ah, that's it, all right. So, uh, Michael, any 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 question? Yes, yes. Um, I I saw one from Felix, our our, our member, right? Okay. So he asked, "What does the ISS do about the space debris that is too small to detect and track?" So actually, yes, of course, there are a lot of debris up there which is too small to be detected and tracked. All right. So in that case, all right. Uh, actually, there's a study performed on this. Um, that there, there's. When every mission go up, we always have a backup. All right, so we 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 don't expect that something fail and then it just dies off like this. All right, uh, we we will have some backup and to see what are the counter or what are the solution we can have so that we don't lose that much in that mission. So actually, in a lot of sector, in a lot of those big satellites, for example, ISS, especially for those uh, with. Uh, with men or those men mission. Uh, we have this, we call the debris shield. That means we actually have another protective layer, sort of pro protective layer on the ISS. So just in case that these debris are too small to be tracked and when it hit the ISS, all right, it, it will minimize the damage caused towards the ISS. All right, so this is it. What This is how we could deal with those small debris that we actually could not track. All right, a uh, collision of debris with ISS or other satellites is actually is actually very common. All right, it's just that whether it causes severe damage or no severe damage, no severe damage. So yeah, so I hope I answer your questions. Any 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 add on add ons? Yeah. So uh, what, what what I'm saying is that uh, the other one is I I'm not very certain, but we can check. Uh. Maybe during a meteor shower, the astronauts will not do any spacewalk because the space suit, uh, the particle come can puncture the space suit. The meteor shower hitting the, the Earth's atmosphere below and a lot of meteorites coming, don't do any spacewalk. But just a tiny hole, uh, it's dangerous to the astronaut, you know. All right, uh, okay. So uh, just, we want to end now, right? Uh, so, yeah. So I think we can end now because I don't see any questions, yeah. any so, uh, additional questions. So maybe we can uh, call it a I session. Think, uh, so... yeah, really, I just end by outlining what's going to happen in the future. All right. Yeah. So uh, those of you who are interested in collecting meteorites, like well, we have found a uh, uh, Malaysian uh, uh, meteorite collector. I don't want to say who. I'm going to say that she's a girl. Huh? Meteorite collector. Uh, we are going to interview Derek. Is going to interview her possibly in October. All right. So of course the main event coming to me is what JWST launch. Yeah, I've been waiting and waiting and waiting since 2007 delayed. 
2009, 2010 delay. So now it seems latest by December this year. Maybe end of November this year, but if not December, right? So now the, all the testing is done in America. So I don't know whether they're going to put it on the ship to travel to the Kuru launch center in French Guiana or an aeroplane. And then they're going to marry it with the Ariane 5 main rocket of the European Space Agency, ESA. And they will launch either end of November, December. Remember, JWST will observe the universe mainly in infrared, can see much further than Hubble, and the discovery will be again ground shaking. The chain it will revolutionize astronomy. See further into space than Hubble, and the discovery will be ground shaking. So we are waiting for the launch. All right. Okay, the other smaller events are we are still following the Tianwen One Mars rover law on the on, on the Mars and the Pilsen's rover. All right. Okay, so I think that's all for me to uh for to, to, tonight. Uh Lion. Yeah. So, so I think we can call it a session for tonight. Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks so, to Yong Lip and uh, David. Nah. So before we end, okay, just a small reminder, all right? So do subscribe our YouTube channel, follow our Facebook page, and also our Instagram, Astronomical Society of Penang, for more information. All right, so I think that's it. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for watching. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Lai. We see you. We see you next month, next airport session. So, which is uh, next month. All right. So thank you, Lai. Thank you, Michael, David, thank you, and Thank you, Lai. Thank you, Doctor Chong. Thank you.